a seminar this evening, as you know, it's called The Myth of Apathy Going Beyond Behavioral Change. And this is uh, a topic that Renee has specialized in. She's from Royal Roads University. She teaches psychology of environmental education and communication in the MA program at that university in British Columbia, and is a psychosocial researcher and has a PhD in psychosocial studies from Cardiff University. Um, and actively speaks and teaches internationally. Now, in, in the program, uh, you can follow through some other details of her CV, but she added that she's been invited uh, at various times to design and teach postgraduate and undergraduate uh, courses in psychology and climate change and environment, both in, in, in China, in Canada, and the United States, including creating the first ever course to be offered at Portland State University on climate change and psychology. She's been working in the environmental sector for 20 years, uh, starting uh, with work with the Econet in the mid-1990s and helping environmental groups utilize the internet for the first time. And she's got a strong connection with the UK. She's been asked to um, support such organizations as the Natural History Museum, uh, Communicate Now, that's the Bristol Natural History Consortium, uh, and others in the UK. So it's with great pleasure um, that uh, we welcome Renee here for her talk. And if that would be going beyond behavioral change, and perhaps you'll welcome her in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you. Is this working? Hello? Yeah, it's fine. And um, is Simon around? Is there a clicker for this, for the PowerPoint? So I can walk around? Clicker for the, so I can walk around? No? OK, that's cool. So thank you, everyone. It's, it's an incredible honor for me to be here. And I'm humbled. And I take the reception to the talk and the, the interest in the topic not as so much about me, but it's reflective of the place we're at right now with regards to these topics around human dimensions, human response to environmental degradation and climate change. Um, so I want to acknowledge that, that we're all here because we're keen and we're hungry and we're, we're really trying to figure these things out. And, um, and I don't necessarily have the answers for you. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about tonight, just for about maybe 30 minutes or so, I want to make sure that we have good enough time for discussion because I think this is really something that we're all engaging with together. What I'm going to talk to you about is a pers perspective and an orientation to how we think about the psychological dimensions of climate change and environmental issues. And I want to first locate where I'm coming from with this, because uh, at the moment, what's really exciting and kind of incredible is that there's an explosion um, of research and interest with regard to psychology and climate change slash environment. Just an incredible explosion. And so we're seeing new reports coming out. When I teach these courses, I actually can't set the curriculum, I can't set the syllabus really um, as a final product because literally there's new reports and papers coming out all the time. And so what I do when I teach this course is I introduce the new pieces as they're coming out, I'm Skyping people in. It's so dynamic and it's so rapidly changing and expanding that we're right in the middle of something that's in formation. So one aspect of that that's really incredible is that uh, someone working in the space for a couple of decades, it's like finally we're starting to think about psychology. Finally, this is becoming a legitimate topic and area of interest and investigation. The other side of that is that it's kind of muddy and murky right now. So my, my central point to start with for you is to consider that there is no psychology of climate change. Uh, there is no singular approach. In actuality, everything that you come across, including what I'm going to be talking to you about, is located in a particular ideology, a particular orientation, a particular set of assumptions and biases. And that, for one, is, is a really important place to start because for those who are investigating this area and are new to this, it can feel like we're just awash. Values, beliefs, Attitudes, opinion, uh, affect, framing, worldview. So chances are most of you in this room have come across work that references 
one or all of these dimensions, neuropsychology, cognitive behavioral psychology, behavioral economics. So each one of you is coming in with some taste from your perspective, your orientation, that for you is what psychology means. And so I want to suggest is that it's multiple, it's plural, and what I'm introducing here is one way to look at these issues that I hope will potentially sort of uh, be a bit provocative and maybe help you know, encourage your own critical engagement with these, with these issues. So as Chris mentioned, I'm also a psychosocial researcher, so just to clarify that my training is in social sciences at Cardiff University, and, and that's the location that I'm coming from, which I think, so everything that you're going to hear in the next few minutes is through that filter and through that lens. Um, we've just had, I don't know if Chris mentioned, we've just been in a full day workshop um, hosted by the Energy Institute here at UCL, very rich, intense workshop, which I'm still buzzing from. If I seem a little, you know, rattled, that's why. I'm still processing what came out of this. But there's, um, so, so we just had a workshop that features psychosocial researchers engaging with these issues with climate scientists and researchers. And it was very rich, really interesting. So I just wanted to kind of locate myself in this space for you as we get started. So the subtitle of my talk is Behavior Change from the Inside Out. And I'm going to talk about a bit about why I'm calling it from the inside out. Um, but that's very, very deliberate and very specific way of framing what we're looking at. And what we're really going to be looking at is how we think about behavior change and challenging the ways that we think about, conceptualize, and frame behavior change. So I want to start first with a story um, from one of my students. So I taught a course at Portland State University, Psychology and Climate Change. And uh, this was for undergraduate students. And I had students for this period of time keep a media diary. So their only brief was to track what comes across their radar or through the media or through their media environment, but mediated about climate change. Uh, for most of the students in the class, they were not already activists, although we think of Portland as very green and very activist oriented. These students were you know, fulfilling requirements, different things that led them to this course. So I wanted to sensitize the students for this finite period of time. And one of the students, Amanda, um, had written this story in her journal, in her diary, that really stood out to me. So she wrote that she had just seen a book called 100 Places to See Before They Disappear. And so she said, I just came across this book, 100 Places to See Before They Disappear. My first thought was, what is this world coming to that we have a book like that? My second thought was, well, I want to get out there and see these places. You know, this is like a 20-year-old young woman. I was like, I want to get out and see the world. It's threatening, it's threatened, it's vulnerable, I need to get out there. My next thought is, well, that's contributing to the problem by my going out and seeing these places. I always get chills when I tell the story. Um, you know, she says, I just feel really despondent. So it just sort of ends with that, that those, those pieces right there. And so what I really got from the story and from my work with organizations and with um, individuals is I identified that there's three central affects in the story that I think we can all relate to in some way. So this is point number one, if you will, that I'm trying to make here is that within, within the issues we're dealing with with regards to climate change, that there is anxiety. In varying degrees, we're going to feel it in different ways. Different things make us feel anxious, right? So I'm not saying there's some uniform expression or experience of anxiety, but there's anxiety. What is this world coming to that we have a book like this? We're hearing existential anxiety, for one. What the heck is going on? What does it mean to be a human being in this time? What does it mean to be a young person in this time that's hearing about these issues? So there's some real anxiety there. We also hear ambivalence. Uh, I want to see these places, right? I mean, how many of us, all of us, I'm guessing in this room, experience these tensions, these poles? Um, you know, I, I want to get out. I want to travel. I want to experience life. You know, I want to experience life to the fullest as I possibly can. Of course you're going to feel that way. Of course we feel this way. 
And there's ambivalence around this. And ambivalence I'm using in a, in a clinical term. It comes out of psychoanalytic theory. It's very rich and arguably one of the most important concepts that we can engage when it comes to human dimensions of these issues. Ambivalence. Hold in different directions, the human capacity to hold competing desires and drives and impulses. We do it all the time, we negotiate them all the time. And finally, there's aspiration. There's this desire to be part. I don't want to contribute to the problem. I don't want to be part of this. So here we see in this story, in this vignette, I think something really important and something I would wager that most of us perhaps in this room can relate to. That where there's anxiety, there's ambivalence, and there's aspiration. So what does this have to do with behavior change? Well, for me, it means thinking about what do we mean by behavior change. Why do we, why are we so focused on behavior and the need to change this. So this is sort of, in a way, my point number two, which is to begin to question our assumptions with regards to behavior. So we've got conflict, we've got ambivalence, we've got aspiration. In other words, this is, this is messy stuff we're dealing with. There's dilemmas and there's conflicts that we're dealing with all the time. Now that sensibility, that way of thinking about things is classic psychosocial, classic psychoanalytic, psychodynamic orientation, just to help locate where I'm coming from for you, especially if this, is, if this is somewhat new. So my emphasis and my interest in dilemmas and conflict is coming out of that location. So what do we mean by behavior change? What are the assumptions in us about human subjectivity when we talk about behavior change? What are we assuming? What are we assuming about people's level of care? So, so how many people in this room, just a quick show of hands, have had the thought at some point or another, people just don't care about our environment or else we'd be doing more? People don't care. Okay. No. People are apathetic. <coughs> okay, so, so what we're looking at here is we're looking at these underlying assumptions and having frankly, compassion for these assumptions because it looks a heck of a lot like people don't care. You know, everyone has their moment when they're really hit by this or several <coughs> moments. You know, for me, it's looking at cars on the motorway, looking at traffic. That's when I feel really despairing. That's when I feel like people really could give a toss. You know, it just seems so obvious, so in my face. <coughs> Are people motivated? This is another common question that we use in the behavior change discourse about motivation. How do we get people to be motivated? What are, the, what are the underlying levers for motivation? In other words, the questions that we tend to think about, how we think about behavior change, what I want to bring out to the surface is that there's an underlying kind of orientation that people don't care, there's a lack of something, and that we have to get people to do what we want. And I think that that way of thinking, that style of approaching human dimensions of climate change is very understandable, and we need some of that. But it's not the whole picture. That's what I want to suggest to you. That, that it's not, I don't know actually how helpful it is, to be perfectly honest. I don't know if that's helping us get closer to our goals and our objectives. Um, you know, what makes people do things differently? What are the drivers? So what's underlying that sensibility is presuming that we are the engineers and we need to tweak and manipulate and change human behavior. And again, I'm not saying that we don't have to, but I want to think about the mindset that we have and I want to ask you whether when we're talking about human behavior, does it make sense for us to think like engineers or might it make sense to think a bit more like psychotherapists? Does it make sense to think like planners? I work with a lot of planners, architects, designers, engineers. Does it make sense to think in that way, 
Or does it make maybe more sense to really embrace the fact that we have certain limits of our knowledge and understanding, and perhaps it makes sense to partner and collaborate and learn from those who work on the front lines. And what I call the front lines, I admit to being a strong proponent of those who do psychotherapeutic practice.